we were discussing detectors used in the spectrophotometers and these include barrier layer, photovoltaic cells, photo emissive tubes, photo multiplier tubes, silicon photodiode transducers, photodiode arrays, silicon photodiodes and photoconductivity transducers. <laughs> this is a uh, barrier layer photovoltaic cell. <coughs> Uh, basically, it contains two glass uh, glass plates. One glass plate is here, and um, another is um, here. It contains a thin layer of silver and a plastic. Uh, everything is coated in plastic, and this is a selenium uh, layer, which will release electrons when the light falls on them and the bottom one is iron plate and this iron plate acts as a conductor. The whole uh, equipment is uh, encased in a glass cell and uh, this photovoltaic cell shows maximum sensitivity <coughs> at 550 nanometers. So, approximately 10 percent loss occurs around 350 to 750 nanometers. Therefore, it is basically very rugged instrument and very low sensitivity and uh, the response is proportional to the radiant power and uh, no external source of electrical energy is required. Such uh, detectors are used in simple portable instruments. Then uh, we have vacuum photo tubes or photo emissive tubes as they are called. Here you can see that there is a cathode here and um, wire anode is here, a photon beam falls on that and releases the electrons and the electrons are collected at the wire anode and the whole thing is under vacuum and um, essentially it is a, uh, the current can be modified and amplified using the 90 volt DC power supply. That means, if the sensitivity is low, you should go for vacuum photo tubes. So, the vacuum photo tubes cathodes are coated with potassium, cesium, antimony etcetera. These are very highly sensitive for uh, collection of the release of the electrons um, when the photo when the light falls on them. Uh, red sensitive sodium, potassium, cesium, antium, uh, antimony are also used uh, or silver and then uh, oxides, silver, cesium, etcetera are also used for coating. Now, uh, the other uh, recently introduced materials include gallium arsenide. This gives relatively constant response. The advantage is current can be amplified, but the disadvantage is it produces dark current and 40 K, 40 potassium. 40, it gives you uh, gives some amount of natural radioactivity, which is not good for uh, uh, usual maintenance. Then we have a photo multiplier tube. This uh, is used for very low light sensitivity, for example, longer wavelength regions. So, here it contains a number of electrodes, cathodes called as dynodes. Here in this uh, figure, you will see that uh, numerous electrons are generated for each photon and um, the photons are collected on the mirrors again directed to uh, dynode, another dynode again collected again this, um, directed to another diode like that. There could be about 9 or 10 diode dynodes which will keep on increasing PMT tubes, photo multiplier tubes contain a number of dynodes coated with beryllium oxide, gallium phosphide and cesium antimonide. A <coughs> each dynode is maintained at, these are the dynodes D 1, D 2, D 3, D 4 etcetera. Each dynode is maintained at a higher potential than the previous one. So, it is uh, it varies uh, from up to 900 volts DC and the cathode is here and anode is here, numbered uh, dynodes are shown above here and they are all connected in the electro the electronic circuit uh, which can be amplified. 
the current can be amplified and it can be taken to read out. This is the figure of uh, this is how a dynode looks PM photomultiplier tube looks and you can see the dynodes are here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 like that and uh, several electrons each dynode releases more electrons than the uh, electro than the previous one. So, the electrons will keep on increasing that means, the current also will be increasing. So, these are uh, used mostly for low wavelength regions and uh, dynode 1 is coated a uh, resistor chain maintains 75 to 100 volts between edges and dynode. That means, um, each uh, dynode is maintained at 75 to 100 volts at uh, higher potential. So, these are used only at lower power levels of 10 raise to minus 14 to 10 raise to minus 4 lumens. You will remember that 1 lumen corresponds to 0 0.00147 watts. So, a wide band amplifier is also required. It is to be used in series with a pulse height discriminator to eliminate spurious low amplitude pulses. The advantage is signal to noise ratio which corresponds to square root of the count rate. So, nowadays there are photodiode array detectors. <coughs> this, these are nothing but a silicon photodiode transducer consisting of a reverse biased p n junction and that is formed on a silicon chip. It consists of a silicon material having a very high resistivity topped with a protective SiO2 layer. So, metal contacts are fixed here you can see metal contact is here another metal contact is here and then this is intrinsic region there is N layer and there is P layer this is the gold back coated this thing. So, the bottom surface provides electrical connections. Here you can see that normal function of a p n junction is like this there are positive uh, holes and then negative electrons etcetera and there is a metal contact here and wire lead is taken from this side these are holes these are electrons. So, when this is operated under reverse bias then what happens this region gets depleted the p region and n region. So, uh, essentially there is no current passing through the contacts. Now, when there is contact they, there will be some electrons and whole electrons will be released holes will be generated and uh, <coughs> uh, the current will start flowing. Suppose, the reverse bias <coughs> um, is applied then the electrons are promoted to the conduction bands and holes and electrons are formed which are swept through the device to produce a current proportional to the radiant power. <coughs> this is the circuit for uh, uh, operating the photodiode arrays. Photodiodes are here and then they are all operated in series and the uh, region <coughs> the in the range of 250 to 500 um, milli amperes per watt in a per watt inverse across the visible spectrum. So, this is at least one order of magnitude higher than the photo emissive tubes, but several orders of magnitude lower than the PMT tubes. So, silicon chips are uh, approximately of the order of about 0 0.025 millimeter square that is very small one and the whole diode is also of the same size. So, a number of photodiodes can be fixed in a two dimensional pattern on a single rectangular semiconductor chip. So, the output from each one can be collected sequentially and simultaneously or simultaneously sequentially also you can collect simultaneously also you can collect using integrated circuits like this and uh, each diode is parallelly connected to a 10 p f capacitor and sequentially connected to n bit shift uh, register and the transistor switches. The shift resistor uh, you can see here the uh, usually 
close sequ sequentially closes each of these switches numerically momentarily causing the capacitor to be charged to approximately 5 volts which then creates a reverse bias across the p n junction. Upon impingement of the radiation in the depletion layer or p region here in this region electrons formed will be uh, collected and which partially discharges the capacitor in the circuit. The capacitor charge lost in this way is replaced during the next cycle. So, it can be made working alternately on off on off like that and the resulting charging current is integrated by the pre amplifier circuit what we have seen here and which produces a voltage proportional to the radiant intensity. After amplification the analog signal is converted into a digital signal and passed on to the computer. So, uh, basically we are uh, looking at different kinds of detectors one is photovoltaic barrier layer cell another is photo emissive tubes and photo multiplier tubes recently for uh, extraordinary uh, circumstances when we have to collect multi channel uh, responses we go for diode array detectors. Now, what about the readout modules? How do you read the signal? The DC signal produced in spectrophotometers are usually amplified and the voltage is read on the analog meters or it can be a recorder or a voltmeter or it can be passed on to a computer through RS 232 connection and then computer displays and high gain amplifiers are usually subject to significant drifts and offset errors. Now, the presence of low frequency noise restricts the signal to noise ratio. This is one of the uh, biggest problem in spectrophotometry because you have to measure the difference between the noise as well as the signal. Therefore, the signal has to be modified by an AC amplifier and converted back to DC output by a demodulator or a rectifier. Sometimes the modulation is performed by interrupting the beam of radiation by a rotating fan or a chopper. What we do is we the beam of radiation is passing we just put a fan so that you can uh, the beam can be cut physically. You can see the figure here. here this is a fan. So, you can see that there are number of holes here and uh, this when this fan rotates it the light will be passing alternately through this hole and then it will be blocked again it will be passed through this hole uh, like that there are number of uh, possibilities and this is a middle finger figure is another uh, design or you can do it electronically with a light beam which with a co and coils. So, it will just flip flop here this side, this side, this side, this side etcetera. So, this is the um, type of modulation uh, we normally look for uh, the when we use a rotating fan or a chopper. So, alternately they can be done electronically also which we saw that earlier. So, an AC amplifier must be tuned to alternate in phase with the chopper that passes the sinusoidal signal during the positive half cycle and blocks it during the negative half cycle. This is a form of rectification basically. Usually a reference signal is provided by the chopper to drive a switch. So, the reference signal is of this should be also be of the same frequency and has a fixed phase relationship with the analytical signal. This is very important because um, the unless it is synchronized you will not get a decent uh, signal at all. So, what you need is a synchronous demodulation and this synchronous demodulation results in a DC signal that can be sent through a low pass filter to provide the final DC output. The tuned amplifier synchronous demodulator reference input and the low pass filter all these are integrated to form a single electronic module 
called as lock in amplifier. Such amplifiers allow recovery of signals which are otherwise obscured by the noise. Some lock in amplifiers directly pass the sinusoidal wave during the first half cycle and invert it during the other half cycle to provide a fluctuating DC signal. Such a signal is relatively easy to filter with a low pass filter. Such devices are called analog multipliers and used extensively in synchronous demodulators. A lock in amplifier is generally relatively free of noise because extraneous signals of different frequencies are automatically cut off and, um, and phases are rejected by the system itself. Now, these are the de modulator designs we have already seen and uh, what happens to the signal? Effect of modulation of a DC signal I am trying to show you here. Basically, what I am showing at the left side here is the frequency and signal power and here it is amplified and then mod modulated uh, to 400 hertz followed by amplification by 10 raise to 5. Now, when we do this, you do see some amplifier noise here a little bit, but all these things will get um, uh, demodulated or that means removed from the system and then what you get here is a beautiful demodulated signal and this is the function of the amplifier um, uh, um, lock in amplifier. Now, there are um, several possibilities a variety of computer programs are available to, um, uh, to the um, enhance the signal to noise ratio. This is important because the signal the noise de determines the basic value of the absorbance what you are going to measure because uh, more the less than that you will not be able to attain at all. So, these include various types of averaging, digital filtering and Fourier transform and correlation techniques etcetera, which are applicable to non periodic or irregular waveforms such as absorption spectrum, signals with no reference wave and sometimes periodic signals also. So, the techniques include SM ensembles averaging box car averaging, digital averaging and correlation methods. We will not go into details of these things except to say that the uh, signals how they can be of use by using different kinds of <coughs> the filtering. Now, you can see figure A is the raw signal, raw spectrum and figure B that is this one is a quadratic with 5 point smooth curve. Suppose we increase it to 4 point fourth degree, then you can see it here like this, the, it is, the signal is still better and uh, suppose you increase it to 10th degree 77 point smooth curve, it will give you a beautiful signal like this. So, the co computer uh, information computer programs will also help in smoothing out the signals. Now, we, uh, these uh, references or what I am giving will give you more details about the techniques and methods of um, the things what we have discussed uh, earlier that is this is G Holic and G M HFJ contemporary topics in analytical and clinical chemistry that is uh, edited. Um, another one is HFJ and Horlick that is in American laboratory 1981. These two will give you more details about the electronics and computer methods, how we go about doing uh, the handling the signal. That is a very important aspect and um, uh, that, uh, that determines how sophisticated your spectrophotometric reagents would be. Now, let us look at some of the commercial instruments. The there are a number of uh, commercial instruments available <coughs> in the market. You can see uh, colorimeters and spectrophotometers. They are called. Their prices range from a few thousand rupees to several lakhs, 
depending upon the type of analysis and sophistication, you can even make one within a few hundred rupees uh, in India for a dedicated analysis that is a calorimeter. So, at the low end are filter photometers and color comparators, these are the cheaper ones and at the higher end are UV visible near infrared sp spectrophotometers fitted with computer controlled instrument operations, process operations etcetera and they are also fitted with microprocessors for data handling. Now, what are the color competitors? comparators? These are basically things which will compare the colors of two. If you know one standard, the other standard you can use, a, you can determine only by with judgment with your eyes or sometimes charts are available in the ch with the charts you can see the color. Now, these are basically relatively inexpensive non scanning filter photometers useful for dedicated analysis of a few analytical parameters. The color development is obtained by adding specific quantity of the reagent to the samples which are <coughs> which can be compared with a predetermined color chart. The concentration is also marked on the color chart sometimes to help uh, assessment. Color comparators are adequate for rough estimates basically and then of the analyte and also for process monitoring or field studies or for specific analysis such as chlorine in swimming pools or gold estimation in jewelry or uh, vapor uh, acid vapors in uh, electroplating shops several things are there available for such small sing dedicated applications. They are not supposed to be research instruments, but rather application oriented dedicated instruments. Now, the next higher end these are some of the color comparators available you will see here on this here the you will see two boxes to insert your cells like this. They have shown one green and one red color uh, solutions and these are to be inserted in these uh, in these places and you can see the uh, color chart provided at the bottom and each color chart refers to some particular concentration and these are the tablets or the reagents which are available in the form of tablets and uh, the color is developed by taking the sample in a beaker and then add this reagent, it will develop color like this, put it here and then compare the color and read the concentration. These are color comparators. Now, the high slightly higher end are colorimeters or filter photometers. These are essentially single beam rugged direct reading instruments useful for visible range. They use a tungsten lamp or LED as a source and a lens to collimate a filter for wavelength selection. You do not use uh, prisms or gratings etcetera in for wavelength selection basically it is a filter and the detector is also a only a sort of a barrier layer cell or a photodiode as the transducer maximum photodiode, but not uh, PMTs. PMTs are very costly to be incorporated in this because um, one thing is uh, the, the cost, another thing is the your uh, wavelength selection itself would not be so accurate. So, PMT would serve no per specific purpose to incorporate such a high quality detector in this. So, what would be the readout? Readout would be in the form of absorbance or transmittance mode or in terms of concentration in slightly more sophisticated instrument. So, how do you operate such instruments? The operation is basically very simple. Uh, you adjust the 100 percent transmittance or zero absorbance with the solvent or a reference solution by simply changing the voltage applied to the lamp. So, in modern instruments reference signal is stored in the memory because they are all single beam instruments it has to be stored again in the memory and then you remove the sample, put your sample, measure the absorbance and then that will be uh, compared 
with the reference values stored in the memory and then the ratio of the sample signal to that of the reference is computed and the absorbance is calculated. Then it is basically a question of reading the meter or the readout. Now, these are filter photometers. This is the figure of a filter photometer, modern filter photometer. You can see that here are the, the sample solutions to be inserted and um, the uh, spectrophotometer is here, body is here, detector would be somewhere inside, the optics would be like this. And this is a very low LED based calorimeter which I was telling that it is something like a filter photometer only, but dedicated instrument, very low cost and uh, uh, the display here is in terms of concentration. It is a reading 0 0.035, but it can be any value depending upon the concentration. Now, the slightly higher end equipments are single beam spectrophotometers. In general, the term spectrophotometer is used for visible range and that is 350 to 800 nanometers. If you have UV, then uh, the range would be 190 to 900 nanometer. They are also called spectrophotometers, but UV visible spectrophotometers. Otherwise, 350 to 800 nanometers, what we see here are co simply called as spectrophotometers. Then another modification is near IR. They can have UV visible and near IR range, which will cover 190 to 3000 nanometers. And single beam grating instruments are usually relatively inexp inexpensive. They are rugged and readily portable. Nowadays, portable instruments are available. These are used for quantitative analysis as well as scanning. That means, with the microprocessors, you can scan the spectrum right from 190 to uh, 900 uh, degree, 900 nanometers or even near IR in the case of plastics and other uh, related materials. The most celebrated filter photometer is Spectronic 20, that is the model which was introduced in the mid 1950s. During that time, the uh, sp uh, most of the research in analytical science was being carried out only by this Spectronic 20 and um, one of the, it is, it is the, was supposed to be one of the most rugged instruments. Even now, you would see in several laboratories such filter photometers still running and uh, modified versions of these instruments are actually available. They are all available in the uh, in the market. You can purchase any of them, and then uh, employ. You can use them uh, for the measurement of the absorbance. Usually, the such uh, instruments employ concave gratings, and microprocessors al are also contain. They contain. So it is easier to scan. It is easier to record the spectrum. It is easier to transfer the data, and uh, it is easier to read the concentration, etc. So, as in filter photometers, here also wavelength scan is performed with the reference solution only and it can be stored in the computer memory because if they are mono uh, single beam uh, instruments, they can be um, there is a need to st uh, store in the memory. Then the samples are scanned and then the signals are ratioed. The output options include log of uh, absorbance transmittance, you can have a derivative spectra, you can have overlaid spectra, you can have repetitive scans, peak location you can zoom in and peak height and peak area you can measure and kinetic measurements are possible through the using flow through cells. So, in general single beam instruments have the inherent advantage of high energy output because all the signal that comes from a uh, single source is concentrated through the slit beam and then onto the sample and then after a part of it is absorbed onto the signal. But uh, in double beam what happens is the same uh, re, uh, the same signal is split into two and then part of uh, intensity is reduced by half. Therefore, the single beam instruments are supposed to be 
very very sensitive and uh, because of their high energy throughput, but their disadvantage is always the baseline sensitivity. Suppose you measure now and then store it in the memory by the time you take out your sample put another one uh, the baseline would have shifted or drifted and that cannot be measured simultaneously. So, suppose the line voltage is uh, different then you are going to end up with wrong results. So, uh, so long as the sing, uh, single beam um, baseline is steady then only it such instruments will be useful otherwise you will uh, have to go for double beam, but double beam intensity is uh, uh, has to be halved one has to pass through the reference one has to pass through the sample simultaneously. So, that whatever changes happen in the incident radiation that is due to voltage will be automatically compensated in the other two in the sample and reference simultaneously. So, you will get a true picture of the spectrum. Now, double beam spectrophotometers are always um, used uh, when the signals are uh, split into two equal radiant power beams, one beam passes through the sample the other through a reference solution or a blank. So, output of the reference beam is kept constant by employing a feedback loop to regulate photo detector sensitivity via dynode voltage. This is very important concept because the ratio has to be reproducible. So, employing a feedback loop always makes the uh, source, um, source current very steady and you get a good signal. Sometimes you can even control the slit width by means of servo motors and you can measure the ratio of p by p naught continuously. This facility would not be available in uh, uh, single beam instruments. So, in such instruments the radiation um, um, UV or visible radiation enters the Zerni Turner configuration. Now, the uh, Zerni Turner configuration we have studied earlier and uh, there we use the gratings and then passing on to the mirror and coming back. I will show you a figure of the Zerni Turner once again shortly. So, the radiation is collected on the in the photodiode as long as the uh, intensities are identical the amplifier has a DC output. Any difference in the intensities results in an AC signal at the chopping frequency. The unbalanced signal gives an AC output which is amplified and used to drive an optical attenuator into or out of the reference. The servo motor can also be connected to a recorder pen which provides the scan. Alternately, the servo motor also can be digitized and computer output of the scans may be obtained. This is also very simple. Here you can see the optical diagram of a spectrophotometer. Here we have a tungsten and deuterium lamp slate and then collimating mirror, grating and then focusing mirror and then you can see that number of mirrors are there 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etcetera 7, 8, 8 mirrors are there in this figure. You can see that the all these things are necessary to keep the, uh, the size of the spectrophotometer a very compact one earlier Russian instruments used to come which would be about uh, the size of a big table and nowadays uh, small table top models, carry models, field models they are all available and um, this is a single beam instrument because uh, source comes only through one single slit. There is only collimating mirror grating to choose the wavelength, it focuses and then uh, taken to the sample and this reference comes here sometimes uh, you have to remove the reference put the sample and then um, it is uh, put a rotating chop chopper followed by photo multiple multiplier detector. A double beam instrument actually would be much more complicated um, the in terms of optical diagram. So, 
the you can use blazed holographic gratings, lenses and then you need the filter wheels, quartz halogen lamp and optical lamps, optical tops and then uh, toroidal mirrors etcetera. This figure is slightly more complicated, but a true representative of the optical diagram and this is the PMT. For, so, for the final this thing it comes uh, the, to the PMT and then computer data handling etcetera they are those things are separate. This is only the optical diagram. Now, what to do? Uh, uh, so far I have taught you how to uh, choose a spectrophotometer for your purpose. Suppose you want to um, use them for only specifically for one or two parameters and that means you want to buy a dedicated one like a swimming pool or somewhere etcetera only one or two parameters you want to monitor number amount of chlorine or something and then it is better to go for a simple calorimeter based on LED because um, the person who operates the instrument would not be knowing much about the chemistry and uh, concentrations etcetera. He just has to uh, run the uh, take a sample, put the tablet, develop the color, measure the concentration. If the color is not there, if the con correct concentration is not obtained, he just has to change the um, change the uh, water etcetera to get these things. So, an person who is not well versed in uh, chemistry or spectrophotometry can handle field instruments provided you give him a ready made uh, chart, ready made uh, reagent, ready made uh, uh, instrument etcetera. Now, uh, the uh, for at higher end suppose there is a for teaching aids you may need a filter photometer because they are all single beam instruments lot of people can be uh, taught using that uh, how to use the instruments etcetera theory and then for limited amount of research and more accuracy you go for a filter photometer. For very high quality research you should go for sp um, spectrophotometers UV visible IR a near IR followed by um, computer microprocessor uh, data handling etcetera depending upon your requirement. Now, how do you use a spectrophotometer? In principle the um, there are uh, uh, method development procedures um, any colored solution can be subjected to chemical analysis by spectrophotometer. So, long as you have a colored spectrophotometer, colored substance, it can be measured using a spectrophotometer. Numerous reagents react sensitively with non absorbing species to give color complexes that absorb strongly in the ultraviolet as well as uh, visible region. Now, a vast literature exists which detail reactions of this type. Typically reaction uh, inorganic reagents include thiocyanate ion for iron, cobalt, molybdenum etcetera. You can use hydrogen peroxide for titanium, vanadium, chromium, iodide ion for bismuth, palladium, tellurium etcetera and uh, number of organic reagents, chelating agents uh, diethyl dithiocarbamate for um, uh, uh, for copper, dithiazone for lead, 110 phenanthrolene for iron, etcetera, dimethyl glyoxime for nickel, etcetera. Number of reagents actually, if you want to take a look at uh, spectrophotometric methods available for the metals, you would be surprised that for each metal there would be about 200 to 250 reagents available and methods are there recorded which you have to scan and choose the applicable method for you, for your requirement. So, typical method development how do you do that is you determine the wavelength for maximum absorption. So, in the maximum absorption what you should at that wavelength you should optimize the experimental variables for completion of the reaction. These include pH, reagent concentrations, temperature, stability of the complex, effect of high electrolyte concentrations and then stoichiometry of the complex etcetera. Now, what is the next step? Suppose you are able to optimize the reaction conditions 
then you should go for the preparation of a calibration curve. How long you the calibration curve is required is followed. So, the linearity of the spectrophotometer you have to determine that means for up to 5 ppm, 10 ppm, 20 ppm depending upon the system. Now, you can evaluate the interfering substances and matrix effects and other ionic species. For example, you may like to determine gold in sea water that is one type of complex. You would know that there are about 3 to 3.5 percent of uh, salt in sea water. So, that will have a different effect on the spectra. Suppose you want to determine gold in jewelry, then gold may be the major component or most probably the only component along with silver, may be some copper. But suppose you want to determine gold in a mobile cell, then in that mobile cell the, it could be just a coating provided on the sample of a few microns. So, the base metal would be iron or tantalum or something like that along with that some coating material followed by gold determination. So, matrix effects and interfering substances always create problems and these things need to be evaluated continuously. Now, you can determine the um, type of the complex. You, can, you have to determine the molar absorptivity. This will tell you how sensitive the material is. So, the method if it is very highly sensitive, molar absorptivity would be very high of the order of about between 10 raise to 4 and 10 raise to 5. Suppose the substance is having very low molar absorptivity, the substance would not be colored. So, you would also like to determine sandal sensitivity that is the sensitivity at the detection limit of 0 0.001 absorbance what would be the concentration that gives you the uh, so much of absorbance. And then you may also like to evaluate statistically the bias. And if you develop a method using all these uh, aspects, including all these aspects, then you would like to determine the element in diverse matrices. That is another part of the research that you would like to be uh, interested in. So, Sometimes what happens is there may be two substances which are having two different colors and um, you would like to determine the uh, concentration of two different substances in a mixture. So, two dissimilar this uh, slide shows you two dissimilar chromophores having different lambda max and molar absorptivity epsilon, if they are present in a given mixture, they can be analyzed if their absorbances are additive. This is a very important concept. Now, the procedure involves measurement of the absorbance at the lambda max of both substances. Then two simultaneous equations can be written. You have C 1 first compound absorbing at lambda 1 its molar extinction coefficient is epsilon 1. Similarly, at the same e lambda 1, the second substance also absorbs. So, that is C 2 E 2 epsilon 2 that corresponds to the total absorbance of A lambda 1. Similarly, C 1 epsilon 2 at lambda 2 plus C 2 epsilon 2 at lambda 2 would give you an absorbance of lambda absorbance at lambda 2. So, we have we know the epsilon, we know the absorbance. So, there are two equations and two unknowns C 1 and C 2. So, they can be solved equation algebraically for the correct uh, determination of the mixtures. For this, you, you will have to remember that both absorption peaks should not occur at the same wavelength. There should be minimum 30 nanometers uh, difference between the lambda max of the first substance as well as the second substance. So, if they are very near, you will not be able to determine. Suppose, you have three samples which are having three lambda max and three mixtures, would you be able to determine the three concentrations in a given mixture? The answer is yes, 
they can be all you have to do is you have to write one more equation C, um, involving 3 parameters that is C 1, C 2 and C 3 and um, these um, equations you will have to write C 1 epsilon 1 at uh, lambda 1 plus C 2 epsilon 2 at lambda 1 plus C 3 epsilon 3 at lambda 1 followed by C 1 epsilon 2 uh, at lambda 2, C 2 epsilon 2 at lambda 2, C 3 epsilon 2 at lambda 2 then third one also you can write all the three simultaneous equations you should be able to solve and then determine the different concentrations. So, theoretically any number of components can be determined by setting up simultaneous equations, but for all practical purposes one can handle three component systems by more than that it becomes slightly difficult and because the lambda max has of the components also have to differ by at least 30 nanometers. So, simultaneous equations can be done and then a differential or expanded scale. Here what we do is we basically change the absorbance range and uh, uh, we call it high absorbance method, trace analysis method and maximum precision method. The, so, we can when we are able to change the absorbances like this see the first one here what I am doing is I am taking a sample between uh, the uh, two different uh, concentrations here is the, on the top you will see that there are three figures um, uh, about 35 percent uh, transmittance I am have adjusting to maximum absorbance and around 20 percent I am adjusting to this thing. So, 0 is always 0. So, I am expanding the scale from somewhere around 35 to read the full scale that is absorbance by opening the uh, slit more. So, if my sample is somewhere around 20, it will uh, cover the whole range, but appear somewhere here. Similarly, if the substance is too low to concentrated very low concentrations are handleable. Then I adjust the, uh, the 100 percent transmittance and 0 percent absorbance. So, my sample is uh, uh, my standard I allow it to go up to this point and uh, 100 percent is same and in between my sample is there. So, in such cases accuracy would be better than the standard method because here the sample is very in low concentration. Sometimes what we would like to do in precious metals etcetera, we need to be still more accurate. We are neither on the higher absorbance scale nor on the low absorbance scale. In that case what we do is we take two standards, one standard is here, another standard is here. So, these one these two we adjust it for 0 percent and 100 percent transmittance and then the sample would be covering a small portion of the reage uh, of the standard would cover the whole um, absorbance range and these th things are known as the uh, maximum precision method, trace analysis method and high absorbance method. But you will be surprised that this can be done only in filter photometers not in spectrophotometers. So, filter photometers still provide you some amount of freedom to play with the absorbance and get better results, but uh, not in spectrophotometers because it is not possible for you to play with the optics and aperture etcetera because most of them are usually the, the controlled by the uh, computer. So, in uh, another aspect is derivative spectroscopy. Uh, in derivative spectrophotometry, <laughs> what we need to do is spectra are obtained by plotting the first or higher derivative of the absorbance with respect to the wavelength as a function of wavelength. Now, what do we mean by that? We take the spectrum and um, this helps we take the first derivative, it helps in the derivative spectrum the ability to detect and to measure minor spectral features 
that is it uh, they are considerably enhanced. The enhanced spectral features can distinguish between very similar spectra and follow subtle changes in a spectrum. So, derivative spectrometry spectrophotometry for that matter is also quite useful for the simultaneous determination of two or more components in the mixtures. So, absorption spectra of the analyte can be extracted even from turbid solutions. So, this is uh, the application for example, we can determine the trace amounts of uh, manganese and zinc in mixtures by complexation with 5 8 dihydroxy 1 4 dinaphto quinone. So, tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine these are aromatic uh, um, amino acids they contain aromatic side chains and with a lambda max in this range 240 to 300 nanometers range these sharp peaks are not apparent in spectra of ordinary in ordinary spectra. But if you take first and second derivative spectra the all these three uh, amino acids tryptophan, tyrosine and phenylalanine they can be distinguished very easily. And uh, derivative methods are usually applied to pharmaceutical preparations and vitamin uh, mixtures. So, applications include uh, quite a lot uh, here you can see the uh, derivative spectra and uh, first one is just absorbance that is at the bottom and at the top is first derivative you can see how the spectrum is changes. But if you do the second derivative spectrum you can see so many uh, fine aspects of the spectra and the mixtures also can give you directly concentration determination provided you do the second derivative spectra. Now, another aspect is photometric titrations you can just like ordinary titrations you can do photometric titrations all you got to do is take a burette take a pipette and then keep on adding the reagents and then it will give you color and you take the substance in a 1 centimeter cell or 5 centimeter cell measure the absorbance and then plot absorbance versus volume of the sample um, volume of the titrant. So, photometric titrations are useful for locating the end point of a titration provided the titrant or the titrand or one of the reaction products absorbs the radiation. This is their foremost requirement. So, the titration curve is basically a plot of the absorbance corrected for volumetric changes that is very important you have to correct for um, the volumetric changes as a function of the titrant. The end point you can obtain by extrapolating the linear portions of the curve and um, the advantage is you can overshoot the titration still you should be able to determine the absorbance by plotting the um, taking the tangents at different portions of the spectrum. So, photometric titrations are basically uh, advantages in that you can overshoot the end point still get the correct uh, end point. Another thing is they can be automated to record a fixed absorbance or by taking the second derivative. Now, you can uh, I, uh, you can uh, conduct different kinds of spectrophotometric titrations and the instrument you will have to modify a little slightly. Here uh, I have shown you a photometric titration in this and here are uh, here you are adding the reagents and you can take the sample and reference through this and then put it there and then measure the absorbance. So, these can be con directly connected to the computer to record the absorbance versus um, volume of the titrant added. So, I am showing you here some of the uh, titration curves here you can see that the volume of the titrant and absorbance curves are plotted. The first one uh, this one it shows that the initially the color is not changing at the end of the titration the uh, complex is formed which have which absorbs and the absorbance keeps on increasing. Now, the end point would be obtained by taking a tangent like this and um, uh, it can be determined. This could be a case something like uh, um, copper titrate being titrated with uh, 
uh, with uh, EDTA for example or ammonia because copper uh, solution in very low concentrations are uh, very dilute and they do not give you absorbance. But um, when it uh, combines with ammonia or EDTA, it starts forming a blue colored complex which can be monitored <laughs> by uh, measuring the absorbance. Now, the second one is um, an example of uh, uh, sample also being colored, but the complex is also colored, but sample uh, the titrant is slightly less colored and uh, once it forms the complex, the absorbance does not increase. This is something like arsenic with uh, bromide bromide, because uh, bromide bromide is also is color, complex is also color. So, the color will keep on increasing at the end of the reaction, the uh, absorbance will attain a constant value. Now, the third one is uh, uh, the example for para toluidine in butanol with perchloric acid. Now, the you can see that absorbance is very low here, that means the product is not colored. So, the para toluidine is um, uh, colored and um, the as the titrant you keep on adding color comes down and then becomes 0. Again as usual you can extrapolate these two parts of the curve and then show the volume of find out the end point of the reaction. So, the um, titrant can react with uh, um, the titrant to produce colored product absorbing at the same wavelength. This is number D. Here also it is forming a color, here also it is forming a color, but the absorbance keeps on increasing. So, here the, the sample would be here the sample would be uh, completely titrated at this point itself. Now, the last one, uh, last two. So, in the last one, uh, last but one, we have colored titrant being titrated with the titrant to produce colored product absorbing at the same wavelength. Here also you can see the colored compound is being utilized. At the same time, the product is being colored. So, the end point can be easily determined. Now, the last one is suppose it forms a complex and then it forms another complex. That means, the so first complex is colored, second complex is not colored, but um, the absorbance, the ratio where the second complex starts forming can be determined using the uh, tangents being drawn from different uh, parts of the absorbance spectrum. So, this is uh, one of the another uh, important applications of spectrophotometric titrations where there is no danger of overshooting the end point. You can automate it, you can use it for uh, various uh, color reactions etcetera and uh, we will continue our discussions on the applications of spectrophotometry in the next class. Thank you.